sheer-faced walls of rock to bring Canadian lumber to worldwide industry. The journey from the forest to the mill embraces a wide variety of river routes which finally converge into one or other of the major waterways of the Dominion. The Ottawa River plays an important part in this respect and every spring the bays and other sheltered places along the shores of this ancient highway are crowded to capacity with logs of Canadian pine. Here they are sorted by sharp-eyed rivermen according to the branding that appears on the butt of every log, a job requiring infinite patience. As the logs are selected, they are formed into booms, a boom being a skirting of logs that have previously been chained together. These booms are floating islands that sometimes measure five or more acres in area and afford an impressive sight as they are towed down the river to the mill. Day after day, the slow procession continues. Mile after monotonous mile, the tugs struggle with their load, navigating majestic rivers, fighting wind and storm, depicting a scene that is typically Canadian, a scene that expresses enterprise and commerce and man's conquest of the forest. The logs find a journey's end in the mill pond, an unimpressive term given by unromantic lumbermen to the body of water that faces the sawmill. From the mill pond, the logs are hauled up an inclined chute by an endless chain provided with hooks, the logs having been previously sorted as to size and quality in order to meet various industrial requirements. The interior of the mill is a marvel of mechanical ingenuity that reaches a climax in the carriage that feeds the logs to the hungry saw. From the conveyor trough, a kicker knocks the log onto the loading arms located at the foot of the deck. Mechanical hands, known as niggers, with human attributes and the strength of a thousand horses, turn the log into position for the waiting saw. Travelling at the terrific speed of two miles a minute, the teeth of the band saw eat into the log as the carriage moves forward. Another log is fed into position on the conveyor trough, while the first log is being rapidly reduced to boards.
His sawmills of Canada reflect the characteristics of modern factories. Mass per tree, an average year in the lumber industry, two billion feet, valued slightly under $30 million, were produced in the mills of the Dominion. This lumber, if placed end to end to form a boulevard 16 feet wide, will extend for a distance of 25,000 miles, the circumference of the world at the equator. Intricate machinery has not only been installed, but is being constantly replaced as more efficient and more economical means are devised. These edgers, handled by expert operators, are examples of modern sawmill practice. Here the lumber is edged to various widths, the bark being removed from both sides in a single operation by revolving saws having adjustable positions on the shaft. The spacing of these saws is determined and manually adjusted with lightning rapidity to meet the requirements of each individual board. When the outside cut or slab is of sufficient thickness, it goes to the slab resaw where another board is recovered, the balance going to the slash saws to be cut into lath and picket lengths. Leaving the resaw, the boards are conveyed to sorting tables and to the trimmers, the trims being dropped through an opening in the floor to be conducted to the lath mill. Beneath the sawmill floor, whirling circular saws reduce the trims to the required lengths for lath and pickets, and the salvaged lumber is transported from various sources in the sawmill to the adjoining buildings that house the smaller woodworking machinery. Labor-saving conveyors of various types are generously represented in Canadian sawmills, and as the belt proceeds, trained sorters select suitable material for picket wood, lath wood, firewood, and other specialized purposes. The picket and the lath factory are hives of industry. High-speed sizing machines veritably eat the lumber. Nearby, an operator is busy butting pickets into lengths. Pickets vary in length from 16 to 48 inches, according to requirements. Skilled labor is employed, the pay being based on the production basis. The greater the production, the greater the pay. Lath is used principally in building construction as a wall support for plaster. A splitting machine cuts the lumber to the required thickness, usually about three-eighths of an inch. When the lath has been cut to size, it is sorted into quantities of 50 and bundled in this simple but effective machine that does everything but tie the knot. Waste is a comparatively unimportant factor in the sawmill. At the end of the conveyor, very little lumber remains having any commercial value. Perhaps the chemists and the agriculturalists of the future will find an outlet for the unwanted leavings of the lumber industry. Even today, sawdust is being used experimentally as a fertilizer to reclaim arid and barren soil. But in the meantime, it is necessary to dispose of a small percentage of waste in great burners, which have become familiar landmarks for the sawmills of Canada. Back in the mill, finished lumber of various thicknesses and widths is rolled onto the sorting table for initial grading and inspection. Conveyor rollers and moving chains are used extensively for transporting the boards to the various sections of the mill. Among the advantages of this system, aside from efficiency and speed, is the low percentage of damage which lumber undergoes in the numerous handling processes. Without these time-saving facilities, Canada's lumber production would be substantially reduced and it is possible that an industry of the first magnitude would have remained in its former position at the lower levels of the industrial scale. Perhaps in no other industry is the inspection phase carried out to such an extent as it is in the lumber trade, where every step calls for a rigid examination by highly trained inspectors. Different defects in the finished lumber are quickly detected and removed although it may be necessary to sacrifice board length. It would therefore seem that the ratio of waste must be very high. On the contrary, most of the timber entering the sawmill is used in one form or other to commercial advantage. Before the boards leave the sawmill, an initial inspection by a grader of many years' experience assures the consumer of the highest quality Canadian white pine obtainable. Grade markings appear on every board. This system protects industry from lumber of inferior quality. Wood has always been subject to discoloration until science devised ways and means of combating an accepted evil. Today, Canadian white pine is chemically treated in what is known as a chemical dip. 
This dipping process protects the lumber with a chemical coating that prevents fungi and tiny organisms from attacking the wood and causing stains. The journey of the lumber from the forest to the mill is all but ended now. All that remains is the sorting of the finished product according to grade, size and quality. As a general rule, the lumber yard is located some distance from the mill, necessitating a privately owned miniature railway to provide the transportation link. The transportation of Canada's forest products is a factor of nationwide importance. Canadian owned and operated railroads in 1934 hauled over 213,000 tons of lumber, a tribute not only to the increasing demand for Canadian white pine, but to the substantial growth of the entire industry. Located on high dry ground, the lumber yard is an example of methodical and scientific arrangement. Here the lumber is dried beneath cover boards designed to protect the piles from the effects of snow and rain. Ventilation is an important consideration in the lumber yard because ventilation controls the drying speed of the lumber. Close piling without adequate ventilation traps the moisture inherent in the lumber, which results in the formation of mildew, a destructive form of rot. On the other hand, if the drying is too rapid, the lumber splits and checks. So great care and foresight must be exercised in the formation of the pile. It is estimated that Canada has about 13 billion feet board measure of standing pine of merchantable size. From this vast storehouse, the average annual consumption is less than 200 million feet, or about 1 60th of the available supply, which is constantly being replenished. Thus, Canada is in a position to meet the commercial requirements of the world without appreciable reduction of her great natural lumber resources. The higher grades of Canadian white pine are piled in sheds as an additional precaution against fast drying. These sheds counteract the effects of stormy weather and permit the loading of freight cars regardless of weather conditions. With the final inspection and grading, each board is branded with the hallmark of quality, a symbol that has become known and appreciated whenever Canadian white pine is used. While the lumberyard has its romantic aspects, it also has a serious role in the complex story of Canadian pine. The lumberyard, for instance, is the buffer that smooths out the peaks of supply and demand, provides labor with a more equitable employment, and assures a material reserve for industrial needs. Technically, the lumberyard affords a period of seasoning for the lumber, although Canadian white pine is noted for its low shrinkage factor and uniform texture, upon which time has little effect. Destined for points that lie north, south, east and west, car loadings are constantly in evidence. Trains of cars that carry Pinus strobus, the prince of pines, to the markets of the world. Canadian white pine sails the seven seas on ships that are outward bound to distant lands beyond the blue horizon. Proud, brave ships that sail into the dawn and the sunset with their precious cargoes of Canadian wood. To some, each sailing may represent investments valued in terms of dollars or pounds, shillings and pence. But the true value is intangible and cannot be estimated by material measures. Canadian white pine is Canada's salute to a higher standard of living, to better and more enduring homes, to industry and its manifold applications. A thousand outlets that unite to make this world of ours a finer and a happier place in which to live. Thus ends the story of Canadian pine, a story that chronicles the happenings of timber on its route from Canada's broad acres to the high road of the sea. In other lands, through years to come, Canadian white pine will lend its durability and its quality to the moulding of the human race, Canada's contribution to the better things of life.